appreciate the, uh, the song, beautifully done, and uh, glad everyone is here tonight. If everyone turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12 and uh, Hebrews chapter 12 as well. Genesis 12, Hebrews 12, are two spots I'd like you to turn tonight. I thank you guys so much for being here tonight as I uh, often just kind of think about church and youth ministry and just, uh, just church ministry in general. Um, everybody that comes to our church comes by their own free will. And when I think about people that are here tonight on a beautiful day that, like today, you had many different options to be in many different places right now, but you chose to be here. And uh, that's a big deal. Um, and, and, and actually, uh, throughout the week, when we spend time in God's word, there's nothing more important than God's people congregating together, getting together to encourage one another and to build each other up in our faith. And so thank you for making that a priority in your own life, in your family's life, uh, to, to be here, to soak up God's word and to encourage one another. And hopefully when you come here that you take time to pray for one another and talk to each other and find out what's going on in each other's lives and, and you make that a, a normal pattern of what you do. So um, uh, apparently this morning uh, when I told Pastor Keith the, the title of my message, it was not intriguing enough. So I changed my title. <laughs> my title is now The Exquisite and Expeditious Encounters. Abraham experienced on his adventure seeking God at Bethel, part two. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, this is this, uh, we're going through the, the book of Genesis with the five different times God encountered with, with people at Bethel. And last time I spoke on a Sunday night, we talked about the first encant, uh, encounter that uh, Abram had. And we'll kind of recap that a little bit because what we're going to do tonight, we're going to pick up right where that story left off. Um, but we're going to kind of just talk about tonight, you know, have you ever been in that place where nothing made sense? Have you ever been in that time in your life where you felt lost and things were turned upside down and instability and uncertainty? Um, sometimes when you're in those times, God shows up in a very specific time, in a very specific time of need, and without a mistake, you know God has spoken to you. And so the real title for tonight is Encounters with God at Bethel, Part 2. Uh, we talked about last time that Bethel means house of God, Beth being house, El being God, so house of God. And it was a location in Bethel that was not just a physical house that God was in, but it was more talking about a location where God was specifically encountered by specific people. And it was such an encounter that it was just like going over someone's house as if God was being the host. Uh, last time we looked at uh, Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 through verse 8, and Abram is traveling from the north of Israel, moving his way down based on a conversation that he had with God. God pretty much just told Abram, get up and leave and go to some undisclosed location, and I'll tell you where you're going later. And he put some promises with it that if you obey, and if you follow me, I do have some promises for you, but go. And so in verse 4, it says, so Abram departed. He trusted the Lord. He went to where he needs to go. And we kind of talked about last week, that, or last time, that, that as he was on his journey, really not knowing where he was going, leaving everything behind, everything that he had known except for his belongings and his family, probably going through his mind was thinking, okay, did I make the right choice? Is following God, was it really the right choice? Is it, would have been better if I would have stayed back? Am I missing out on opportunities in life for following the Lord? Because right now, I have no place to stay. I am just on the road, really from all I know, to nowhere. And it was at that time that God showed up in Abram's life at Bethel, and reinforced in his life and, and reassured him that the direction that he was on and where God has led him to go was where he wanted him. And it was actually at that encounter, he told him, hey, look out at this land before you. This is the land that I have promised to you. And Bethel is actually embedded right in the center of where Israel currently is today. Well, from that point, that is when Abram made an altar 
at Bethel, and when he had this encounter, he called out unto the Lord, and the Lord appeared unto him at Bethel. Well, tonight we're going to look up, we're going to pick up right where we left off. We're going to look at verse number 9 of uh, Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to kind of read a little bit of passage at a time, just kind of expositorily our way through this. So verse number 9 says, And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. The thing that's interesting, God told him at Bethel in just the, the previous couple verses, this is the land I've promised for you. Why didn't he stay there? The next verse says, so he continued traveling south. Abram is now going to take a step going beyond God's will or beyond the area to where God had for him. Um, when following God, it is possible to be wrong by lagging too far behind. And in that case, that could be Abram could have just stayed back home and not obeyed the Lord. Or you can do what he's going to do here. You can disobey the Lord by getting ahead of the Lord or going too far. And we're going to find that he's going to go so far south, he's going to walk out of the promised land into a land that is not promised to him. And so really what it boils down to, really kind of the key in the Christian life, many times it boils down to us having balance. Uh, balance is a very hard thing to strike in the Christian walk. And in balance is when we find, uh, really when we are really honed into God's will. Some examples of finding balance, um, John chapter 4 verse 24 says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, there's two components that need to be present in worshiping the Lord that need to be in balance. Um, Proverbs chapter uh, 25, verse 10, talks about mercy and truth. It says, uh, Psalm 25, uh, verse 10, it says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, unto such as to keep the covenant and his testimonies. And so mercy and truth, and 1 Corinthians 5, 8, talks about sincerity and truth. And so... When you look at these two extremes, really, you can have one side of it where you live a life of all truth and no sincerity or, or, or no mercy, and this type of person is someone who is a very cold person, someone who is uh, maybe a very judgmental person that is very a matter of fact and just, uh, just really just kind of critical in everything they do because they're just very truth-driven and not very uh, balanced with mercy on the other side. Well, another person can err on the other side of this of just being filled with mercy and filled with compassion and love to the point where they excuse truth and whatever you do is just acceptable because I just love you no matter what. And it can be a, a type of mentality where it's all driven by, by feelings and emotions and dismisses all truth. And that is also out of balance. And so really what ought to be the balance is both Mercy and truth combined at the same time, and what that looks like is that you stand for truth, you stand for principles, you stand for what is right, and when other things are in disagreement, you do not back down on those things, but you're not at the point of trying to stand for truth to condemn and criticize. And in fact, when someone is out of line in truth, you try to stand for truth, and through love, you try to bring restoration to the fallen that's there and bring them back to a loving relationship and back into truth. And so really, uh, this balance of sincerity or mercy and truth is really what we ought to be living in in the Christian life. And so we'll find here that, that as Abram is following the Lord, he's going to go out of the abounds to one extreme. He's going to go beyond the boundaries as he's traveling south and going out of the promised land that he was currently in at that moment. Well, as we continue reading in verse number 10, it says, and there was a famine in the land. I think it's interesting to note that the moment that he begins stepping foot out of the promised land, God brings a famine. You see, when we begin to step out of bounds of where God wants us to be, God will oftentimes bring chastisement into our life if you are a child of God. Um, if you have your, your finger there, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and keep your finger there in, in Genesis. 
um, I want to kind of cross-reference uh, a passage with this concept. Um, if you are here tonight and you are saved, you are a child of God. God is your heavenly father. And just like an earthly father-child relationship, we have the same type of relationship uh, with a, someone who's saved as a child of God with our heavenly father. And uh, just as a uh, loving parent will discipline their children when they're out of line, God will also discipline his children when, when we are out of line as well. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So the Lord chastens his children, and the motive is because of love. Uh, sin, really what sin is, is stepping out of an area and living in a way that is not best for you. And so God wants what is best for you. And so when we step out of line, God wants to uh, make that pathway away from him difficult so that it can be a means of drawing us back to him and doing what's right. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. It says, if you endure chast uh, chastening, God deal with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse 8 says, but if, if ye be without chastisement, whereof, you are, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Uh, every child of God receives chastening of God. I think that's important to note. It says there, it says, every child of God receives chastening of the Lord. So if you're here tonight and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved here tonight, you, in your life, at some point in the past, even now, and in the future, you will receive the chastening of the Lord. It's because God loves you. It is because God wants what's best for you. You see, God is more interested in making you and I better than he is in making us comfortable. It's, it's many times, it's like a coach. It's the it's exact same concept. Uh, a coach will be very hard on their, on their team, like if it's a basketball team, they'll drive them hard in basketball practice, running them through drills or making them run laps and suicides and all these things to make them be conditioned to become the best basketball player and athlete that they can become. And it's not because the coach hates them. He's trying to make them better to become what the best that they can be. And so really as a parent, you really are a life coach to your children, and there's certain things that as you chastise your, your children, it's not because you hate your children, you love them, but you want to instill in them character so that they can become better uh, human beings and better people and better living for the Lord. And so God does the same thing with every single child of God. God is trying to work into your life and he brings chastisement in your life in a means to make you a better person, a better Christian, and pull out the best out of you. And so on the same side there, what it talks about is that if you're not a child of God, you're an illegitimate uh, child as it talks here, you're not a child of God. God's not going to chastise you. You're not his own. And so if you're here tonight and you can live in sin and you uh, enjoy living in sin, you don't get caught doing sin... That is a huge red flag that you might not be saved. I specifically remember that when I was uh, saved as a 14-year-old, I was not raised up in church. And I remember there was some things that I did prior to being saved that there were sins that I was in. And I remember after getting saved, doing those same sins, and for whatever reason at that time, I did not understand it, I could not get away and with the sins that I did, that, that started doing after I got saved that I was able to get away with when I was lost. It was because I became a child of God and God was chastising me and not allowing me to continue down a path of sin. I specifically remember it as a very new Christian. And so if you're here tonight and you are a Christian, you might be able to realize that there are certain sins that you just cannot do that you know you're not going to get away with it or you just know that you'll be miserable on the inside of conviction of because you know that God is chastening through you the, through those things. Uh, the most miserable people on this planet are saved people living in sin. 
Because God will chastise them to the point to where if they will refuse to come back to him, he will keep chasing them and making their, their punishments or disciplines worse and worse and worse and more severe until he eventually either brings them back or brings them to a breaking point where they hit rock bottom. And so uh, in verse number 9, as we continue on here, Hebrews 12, verse 9, says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our, our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much, much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but, uh, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So the goal of chastisement from God is, is not just to punish you. Uh, that's not the end goal of it. It's said there in that passage, it's for our profit. So the, the, the goal of God bringing chastisement into our life is to discourage us from continuing down a path of sin and to draw us back to him into, into corrective uh, behavior of obedience. Um, chastisement is always in the benefit of the child. Um, and, and a child is always better off living a holy life for the Lord as compared to a rebellious life apart from the Lord. Um, and then the next verse talks about chastisement is, is not fun for the short, short term, but uh, cre creates long-term benefits in the long term. Now, with all that concept being said of chastisement in Hebrews 12, we come back to, to Genesis chapter 12. So as, as Abram has stepped foot into this promised land, and has began to be walking out of this promised land, God brings this famine, and there's going to be a series of circumstances that God is going to bring into Abram's life. Uh, some of it is God intervening. Some of it is, is some of Abram's uh, own, own actions that, that bring it. But there's going to be some chastisement that God is going to bring into Abram's life to eventually get him back on course and bring him back to where he needs to be. So as we continue reading in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, in verse number 10, it says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. So he went so far south, he went outside of the boundaries of Israel, and he now enters into Egypt. Uh, Egypt is, is never really mentioned as being a, pay, a place in the Bible that's positive. Uh, many times is, is resembled as a place of the world. And so... Uh, our circumstances always get worse when we try to do our own, own way, separate from God's ways. Now we see Abram, as he's kind of running from God here, kind of taking a, a detour from where he's supposed to be, he's going to try and fix his problems. He's going to try and, and use his own logic and reasoning here. Now, kind of put us into context, at this time, uh, Abram is 75 years old. He's married to Sarai, his wife. She's 10 years younger, so she's 65. She's 65, and uh, the next verse we're going to read here, apparently at age uh, 65, she was still very attractive. Um, so let's, let's look at verse 11. It says, And it came to pass when, when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he sent unto Sarai, his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. So he's like, Listen up, toots. Uh, I know you're 65, but I tell you, you still got it. And I, I don't know who, uh, who's here and you're married and, and your wife is, is 65 or older. Um, here's some great marriage advice. There ought to never be a point to where, husbands, your wife is not beautiful to you. And... She was 65, and I don't know how that conversation goes, what those compliments were, like, you know, hey, Sarai, those varicose veins, those are nice. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't know how those conversations went. But uh, she was very fair to look upon. And so they, they, so he comes up with this plan, and in verse 12 and 13, he has this conversation with Sarai, and he's like, all right, this is the plan. We're going into this this land of Egypt, we don't know these people, and this is what we're going to do. So this is what he says in verse 12. He says, Therefore it, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is thy wife, and, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. And he tells her to, to say this. He says, Say, I pray thee, 
Thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So this is what he was thinking. It's like, okay, my wife is attractive. I'm going into this, this, this stranger's land. They're going to see, see my wife. They're going to want to take my wife. And if they know that I'm married to her, they're going to kill me so they can have my wife. So he says, okay, wife, you need to let these people know we're not married. You're my sister. So if they ask you what our relationship is, you're not my wife. You're my sister. Okay, so that way they won't kill me. They might take you, but at least I can stay alive. That's the plan, okay? <laughs> what a sacrificial guy. Um, so verse number, um, verse number 14. It says, And it came to pass that, that when Abram was, was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. So he didn't, he, Abram wasn't blind. They also saw this too, that she was very attractive, all right? So verse 15. It says, And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and, and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And, and he had uh, sheep and oxen and he asses and, and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So they enter into the land. And sure enough, they recognize that Sarai was attractive. Well, word got out to the people of Egypt, and that went all the way up to Pharaoh, and they told Pharaoh, like, hey, this guy is visiting in the land, his wife, or, well, his sister is very attractive, and you ought to take her, take her in and take her as your own wife. So sure enough, he takes a recommendation, and the Pharaoh takes Sarai into his house. Now, I don't think there's much time that passes in this passage. In fact, I think they come in one day. This happens overnight one night, and the next day, I think they're, they're out of here. But uh, this, same, this same night, what happens, as Sarai is in their, in their house, Pharaoh and everyone in their house are plagued. Uh, I, I don't know what the plague is. I don't know if it was, uh, you know, skin boils. I don't know if people started having uh, COVID. I don't know what they had. You know, they, they, they started coming down with something, and it was... It was just very apparent to Pharaoh that the only thing that changed in his life was that this woman moved in this house, something's not right. And so somehow he, end up, he ends up finding out that, that Sarai was not his sister. So in, in verse uh, number 18, it says, And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why dost thou not tell me that she was thy wife? So he knew, he figured it out. It says, what sayest thou? She is, thy, she is my sister. So I, I might have taken her to, to me to wife. And now, therefore, behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. Verse 20, and Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all he had. So Pharaoh finds out, he calls him out and tells him, hey, you lied to me. You told me this was your sister. And apparently, the people of Egypt, at least at this time, had more character than what Abram did. And he, t and he pretty much told him, he says, hey, if I would have known that this was your wife, I would not even try to, to do what I was trying to do with your wife. And, and he's like, how dare you do this and, and potentially have me commit adultery here? And he says, you're a liar, you're a deceiver. He says, get you, your family, and your belongings out of here. So now, Abram was on this journey previously with no place to go. And now, he's kicked back out on the road with no place to go again. This time of uncertainty and instability um, was not from trusting the Lord with the uncertainties of his life like it was previously. This time, his uncertainty and instability in his life was from trusting himself and causing a mess of his life and trying to do things his own way. Sometimes in our life, we find that there's uncertainties and instability in our life because we're trying to follow the Lord and we're doing what's right. There are other times in our life where we have uncertainties and instabilities 
because of decisions that we have made in our own wisdom and trying to do things our own way, and we create our own problems that brings instability and uncertainty in our life. But the reality is, whether you're following the Lord doing what's right or you're creating your own mess, all of us here, no matter which path that we're on or or pursuing, we all experience uncertainties and instability in life. And so what we need to realize is that when we we are in these times, is that regardless of what path that we're on, we need to make sure that we are always turning to the Lord in these times of uncertainty, uncertainty and instability because that is the only place any of us will find peace and stability in our life. We now enter into Genesis chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. It says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. I just think it's interesting to note here, too, that even in spite of our disobedience sometimes, uh, God still blesses us. Uh, verse 2 talked about he was very rich. He had all kinds of silver and gold and all, all kinds of cattle. Uh, it, he very easily, with that foolish decision that he made being in, in Egypt, he could have very easily been killed and lost everything. God spared him. God still blessed him. And because of God's grace, he was still able to get through this. And we're going to see eventually where he's going to get to in the next couple verses. I do want to pause there for a moment there. I think, it's a, I think it's healthy for us to reflect here that we can easily look back in our lives and we can look back and see what mistakes that we've all made. I can look at my life and I know what mistakes that I've made and I, I can look back and I, I, there's specific times I can remember. If it was not for the grace of God, uh, there were times where I'd probably not even be here today. And you might sit here tonight And you can look back at your life on some mistakes that you have made. And if it was not for the grace of God, you would not be here tonight or not have the blessings that you have in life if it was not for God's grace. And I think it's a healthy reminder for all of us to realize that we are not self-made prodigies and that God is many times interwoven into the details of our life that in, in spite of our destructive behavior, God is still there, although maybe chastening us in areas, he still has our loving arms around us. In verse 3, this this passage continues on, and it says, And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, on to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. So now, this is probably just a few days later that he just left Bethel and he has come back and returned right where he started. It was interesting, I was just looking at the, the meanings of words because especially in the Bible, um, <laughs> words have meanings. And so as we talked about, the word Bethel means house of God. But it talks about his tent was located in between Bethel on one side and Hai on the other. So I looked up Hai, and what Hai means, that, that word is defined as a heap of ruins. And as I began to think about that, how, how interesting that is, that all of us here tonight, we really just kind of stand in between two paths in our lives. A path of following the Lord and his ways, a path of following our own wisdom in our own ways, It is interesting as you follow those two different paths that you're in between, they eventually lead you to a destination that is either a pathway to where is the house of God or a pathway that is a heap of ruins. Tonight we have those choices to make that are always presented with us every day throughout our life. Sometimes they're small decisions, sometimes they're bigger decisions, 
but these decisions we are constantly making is either are we depending on God and his word and his principles to make our decisions that will lead us to a path to where God is, or are we going through life basing our de decisions on our own opinions, our own logic, our own rational thinking, uh, what other people are thinking and what uh, specialists are saying, and going down a path that eventually will lead us down a heap of ruins. Chapter 13, verse 4 is actually the last verse I would like to, to read tonight. And as he is at this place at the beginning, verse 4 says, On to the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Abram returned to the place where he first encountered God last time. And the altar that he built last time, when he called upon the Lord and the Lord appeared unto him, was still there. You see, the chastening of the Lord at the moment when God brought the famine and the plague and all those different circumstances when he was kind of running from the Lord or mis misdirected in the wrong path, all the chastening of the Lord brought him full circle right back to where he was with the Lord last time. And at that time, he was able to call upon the Lord just like he did last time. You see, it's a lot easier to find the Lord in our lives when we already have the structure in place to find him. It's easier to hear from God when you already have a consistent time of prayer in your life. It's much easier to hear from God when you already have a set time to read your Bible every day. You see, people are searching for answers to life's questions all over the place, but many times it's leaving them with more questions. The stability of God, the stability of God's word are a solid foundation that all of us can build our lives upon that we can find stability and security. So as we bring this to a close, if everyone stand to your feet and as the musicians come, I have some closing questions or some closing thoughts for you. We talked about balance being the key. It really, where Abram found himself is he got away from the Lord because he was out of balance in his life. What areas in your life tonight would you consider that are out of balance, that are hindering you from following the Lord with your all? You know, God will chasten all of us who are a children of God when we stray from him. Has he been chastening you? And if he is, are you aware as to what God is trying to show you and teach you in your life as he's trying to get your attention? Do you never receive correction? Are you saved? Are you one of those people that we described about? Are you like one of those most miserable people on the planet because you are saved and you're running from the Lord? Turn back to him. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not miserable in your sin. You enjoy your sin. You never feel like you have any consequences for it. I, I want to encourage you, you probably need to get saved tonight. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short from, from, from God, but all of us need to come to Jesus Christ at some point in our life when we call upon Lord and we ask him to save us. Have you done that? Have you ever made that choice in your life to trust Christ as your Savior? When we trust in ourselves over God, <laughs> our circumstances often get worse. Are you trying to trust God and his principles for your circumstances, or are you trying to solve your problems with your own tactics and ways of your own way? You will most likely make your matters worse if you try to do it your own way. Turning to God in your, in your time of uncertainty and instability is the only place that you will really find true peace and stability. Remember, God has often blessed us in spite of our mistakes. Maybe you take this time tonight just to thank God for his goodness in your life. Uh, Abram was able to return to the place where he first found God. 
and the altar was still there from the first time. There's a time in your life where you can remember, like, hey, there was a time where I remember I was close with the Lord. And that time is a distant memory. Through God's love, his grace, his chastening mercy, he can bring you back to that place again. If it's been a while since you've been there, I want to encourage you to find that place. Maybe here tonight, maybe you just need to rebuild an altar. Maybe it's been so far removed since you've been at that altar that it's no longer still standing. Maybe you need to repair it. Maybe you need to rebuild it. Maybe tonight you need to put some structures into your life that will allow God to be continue speaking to you in your life. What's well, a, a time of prayer, a time of, of in God's word. And so at this time, as songs are being sung, we'll have the altar that's open here. You can come forward, you can pray at the altar. You can pray where you are in the pew. You can pull someone aside next to you and pray with them. This church ought to be a house of prayer. And any time that we are entered into, the, into God's word and we open up God's word, shame on us if we ever walk out of here and we never apply it to our lives or internalize it or make it a part of who we are. And so the invitation time is really one of the most important times of the, any service is when we take God's word and we say, God, what do you have for me? What is it from this message, Lord, that you want to put in my life? And one part of the message might hit with some person, a different part of the message might hit with somebody else, but there ought to be something in God's word that is a living word of God that speaks to your heart. And you respond and say, God, yes, in obedience, Lord, I am responding to this. Yes, I'm going to follow you. Yes, God, I want to have my encounter with you. God, I want to call out onto you just as Abram did in this passage. So as the music is sung, take this time to talk to the Lord.